So good morning, everyone. My name is Fabien Gélina. I'm a professor of law at McGill University. I'm a co-founder of the Cyber Justice Laboratory. And I'm a, a leading uh, working group two uh, in uh, our uh, big project. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, this morning to introduce Joël Pino, who's a professor at the School of Computer Science at McGill University, where she co-directs the Reasoning and Learning Lab. Uh, she's a, a, a core academic member of MILA, um, which is the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms, and a Canada CIFAR AI chairholder. She's also co-managing director of uh, Meta AI Research. She holds a BASc in engineering from the University of Waterloo, and an MSc and a PhD in robotics from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Joël's research focuses on developing new models and algorithms for planning and learning in complex, partially observable domains. She also works on applying these new algorithms to complex problems in robotics, healthcare, games, and conversational agents. So she serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Machine Learning Research and is past president of the International Machine Learning Society. Um, she uh, has a, a large number of uh, prizes and fellowships uh, to her name. Uh, I will not go into detail so that you can hear uh, directly from her. Joël. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I, am, I, I always welcome the opportunity to have a conversation across disciplines, and I think at this time, in particular, the conversation between people developing AI research and sort of pushing the frontier on AI, and people who have a background, whether in law, in sociology, philosophy, ethics, is particularly timely. Um, my talk today is really designed to give you a bit of a whirlwind tour of what is happening in AI. Uh, I may pose a few problems that may be more fruitful for future interactions or collaborations across our disciplines, but really I'm going to focus on trying to ground you in where the research is going from a technology point of view. And so because I, I just wanted to, to, to take us down to the, to the basics, you know, just winding back to the beginnings of AI, 1956, the term was coined, the field was in a sense founded. And at that point, we posited that to achieve what we at the time already identified as human level intelligence, sort of our best reference for this notion of intelligence that we wanted to build in our machines, we had to decompose the problem in several sub-problems. Problems of understanding images, understanding language, building memory, reasoning, planning. And for 50 years or so, the field moved with these sub-disciplines acting with relative autonomy. In comparison to human intelligence, though we have some notion of how these capacities may be divided across the human brain, the integration of all of these skills is much more symbiotic. In machines, it's actually still to this day, and you'll see as I proceed with the talk, still quite decomposed in a set of different functionalities. Nonetheless, over the next last 10 years or so, we've seen one of these sub-disciplines sort of emerge, which is machine learning. And machine learning, in a sense, has provided, have proven to be the key that unlocks capabilities across many more of these sub-problems. And so we're moving to an era where this notion of intelligence being integrated across different types of capacities is much closer to where we were before. And so this divide also marks a bit the divide of how we build intelligence into our machines. First 50 years or so, the dominant approach was much more a programmatic approach, so giving instructions to the machine of what to do, of course, in the language that the machine understands, so computer code that gave recipes to the machines of how to solve problems. That was very effective for problems such as, for example, building an AI system to play the game of chess, checkers, even build some expert system, cases where writing out the rules provides sufficient information to solve the problems. 
last 10 years or so, even 20 years now, um, the approach from machine learning have really started to come to the forefront because they have much more ability to be flexible. So taking as an example the case of a system that is built to analyze images, in this case brain scans, and out of these brain scans try to delineate the location of a tumor automatically, it's very difficult to write a precise set of instructions because every tumor is different, every brain is different, the imaging system that acquires the image varies from one location to another. And so writing a precise set of instructions is going to be a very brittle approach to solving this problem. Machine learning, on the other hand, proceeds by showing several examples, thousands if not millions of examples to the machine, and through analyzing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, through analyzing these images, really the machine picks out the patterns that are predictive of certain properties in this case, the location of a tumor. And frankly, how machines do it in these kinds of tasks isn't all that different than how humans do it, how we train, for example, radiologists, surgeons to analyze this kind of data. They don't read a list of instructions necessarily in a textbook. They look through example. They develop a sense of what are the features to look for and how to balance different types of information. And so if we really zoom in more precisely on the type of learning approach that I'm talking about here, it's what we call supervised learning. There's a concept, for example, an image that is given, but there's a, that concept is annotated, it's named. So in this case, on the top left of the image, you have a set of different pictures of an abacus. They're all very different. Most people who know this concept would recognize each of them as an abacus. And so you present several of these different images, all of them paired with the name of that concept, and the machine learns to generalize such that later on when it's presented with the three images on the bottom and it's asked which of these three images is an abacus, it's able to pick out the image on the left. It's never seen this specific type of abacus, but it's seen enough different examples to generalize what are the specific properties that are predictive of this being an abacus. And similarly, it can be done across thousands and tens of thousands of different classes of concepts. And so if you think of what we are talking about when we talk about supervised learning, it's called supervised because a human is giving the supervision, is naming the concept. In contrast with this unsupervised learning, we would be feeding large amounts of data without naming any concepts. And we'll see examples of those systems a little bit later on. So in this case, we're presenting many, many images. This is the data set. It gets distilled by the computer program into a model. The model is essentially what captures the representation. That model is a set of numbers. You can think of it as just a list of numbers or matrix. That matrix is essentially the identification of the set of all the concepts together. So early on, it's a random function. We've put in random numbers in that. And through presenting more and more data, those numbers get more precise such that the function can properly predict a large set of these concepts. And so machine learning is essentially building these prediction functions. This is what we're trying to do with this, supervised learning in particular. Sometimes, you know, people hear about deep learning. So we have AI, machine learning is a part of AI. Within AI, we have deep learning. Montreal in particular has really been leading at the international level the development of this technique called deep learning. Notion of deep learning is that when that function is a particular kind of function called a neural net, an artificial neural net, but that is inspired by human biology. So in the brain you have neurons, and the way that we learn is by reinforcing the connections between certain neurons when information is presented. And similarly in the computer system, we have artificial neurons. Think of them as just a little line of code with a few numbers. And every time you present information, you tweak the numbers to reinforce the connection between different neurons. And when we pair many, many of these neurons together, passing information between each other, and we adjust the weights between each of these neurons, this is the principle through which we learn a function. So if at some point, you know, some of your students come and take an AI course in, in, in our department, we'll teach them exactly how to do that and how to train these systems. For the most part today, we have very good publicly available software that can do a lot of this. You can present the data, you can name the concept, feed it in, and you'll get your prediction function on the other hand. 
But the reason I want to bring it up to this level of detail, even if for this group, is because there's often this notion that AI is a black box, that we don't know what's going on inside the black box. And the reason I decomposed it a little bit more this morning is actually to share with you the view that this is not so much of a big black box. We can peek under the hood. We can look very precisely at what is being computed by this function. It is repeatable. We present the same information. It will make the same prediction. We can trace the flow of information. We can trace down which features were used to make a particular decision. It's a very, very complex function. It's not interpretable in a way that humans can understand with a small number of words, which is our common language. But it is interpretable if you want to audit the system, if you want to dig deep in and understand what were the sequence of computation that led to a particular decision. Enough with the math for this morning. Let me show you a little bit of what that means in terms of actual systems. Up to 2012, most of the systems we have for analyzing images were not built on this neural network technology. They were used on other technology that analyzed geometrical features of the image, a little bit more of the rule-based system, with a little bit of flavor of learning, but not very much. 2012 seminal result coming out of the University of Toronto, in fact, Jeff Tindon's group over there, developed a system that could analyze images, many images, and analyze the nature of the concept in the image. It's a little bit small for you to see, but there's a label in the middle of it that says people and tree. This is the prediction from a machine learning system built in 2012 for this image. We called it the AlexNet. It was sort of a revolution in the field of AI because finally we had a system that could analyze millions of images and identify thousands of different concepts, not just cats versus dog, but in fact, a hundred different species of dogs and 40 different types of flowers and so on and so forth. So the level of accuracy and granularity of information that we could get from the system was incredible compared to what was possible before. This is 2012, we're talking about 10 years. At that time, you look at an image globally and you get one or two concepts from that image, usually information that's the forefront of the image. Fast forward just a few years, 2015, we had a system that not only would give you one or two concepts, it would put a bounding box around that concept. So it doesn't just tell you people, there's a, some people in this image. It actually gives you a box of where the people are located. It can handle some amount of occlusion. So one person is a little bit in front of the other person. You got overlay in the bounding boxes. 2017, we have a system that acknowledges that most people and objects are not boxes. And it does the delineation at the pixel level. So you have that analysis of the image where the people are delineated much more precisely, trees and so on. It only does this for the forefront of the image. If you look closely, you don't have the information on the background of the image. 2019, we have a system that is able to do what we're now calling full semantic annotation and segmentation of the image. So it can take all the image, the forefront, the background, identify every piece of information associated with a particular concept, be consistent within the surface of that concept, and do that with high level of precision over thousands of classes of objects. And so this is the span of seven years in terms of development of AI technology. But what that changes, if you go from an image that has one concept to an image that has full semantic analysis of the whole image in terms of application is huge. If you want to train, for example, a self-driving car and you have a system from 2012, you are not trusting that system to drive in the streets of Montreal. It's going to tell you, you know, road, pedestrian, without any more information than that. 2019, with the systems that we have, we have full analysis. You can pick out where are the pedestrians, where are the bikes, where are the trees, where's the stop sign, where's the end of the road. It completely changes the landscape in terms of what we can do in application in the span of seven years. And so really this is why we are talking about a revolution in terms of artificial intelligence because the change of what we can do with data has completely transformed the potential of applications across almost all spheres of our society. This doesn't come for free. This comes through the advent of a few things. One, I've talked a little bit about the algorithms and the role that Montreal, Toronto, research groups in Canada have played in developing these algorithms. 
A large part of that is the availability of data. Without data, we cannot train these systems. And so I'm giving you here a bit of a projection in terms of the growth of the availability. This is human produced data across different spheres of activity. If you notice carefully the left axis, the y axis, I guess you're missing the first. Uh, this is in zettabytes. I'll invite you to look up after what it means to be a zettabyte. I assure you it's bigger than a gigabyte, it's bigger than a petabyte, it's bigger than a terabyte. It's very, very large amount of data. And so this is, in a sense, what is being used by these algorithms. It's not just the data. There's the algorithm, which allows us to build the model. The data is necessary to adjust the parameters of the models, the strength of the connections between the neurons. And you need very large compute infrastructure. So this is a bit of an indicator of how much computation was used to train some of the largest model released across our research community. You may think this is a flat line, but if you look carefully, the y-axis is on an exponential scale. And so the amount of computation, meaning the number of computers that are necessary to train models at this scale, is also growing exponentially. There's a lot of discussion to whether there's an end to that exponential growth. In particular, um, so far we haven't seen that slow down, uh, despite many predictions to the contrary. We're going to have to see how it, how it uh, goes over the years. And so just to recap where we are, right, really uh, up to a few years ago, we're really in, the, uh, you showed you results up to about 2019, we're really in the sphere of supervised learning where you show lots of amounts of it data, you train a function to predict very specific concept. This works quite well in single modality. So images, I can build a large system for images. If on the other hand I have sound, I can do something very similar, you know, play lots of different excerpts of music and predict which genre of music is, uh, is being played, which artists, for example, what instruments, and so on. But it relies on human annotations to do that, and it also relies on each of the data being treated separately. So you need a different model to analyze images, different model to analyze sound, so on and so forth. Moving forward, since 2019, the technique that we've been really developing is a technique called self-supervised learning, acknowledging that getting all these annotations from humans is labor intensive, it's expensive, it's slow. And so if the machines could get away by training themselves without us telling them what all these thousands of the objects are, it would be much beneficial. And so this technique for self-supervised learning is very interesting. Here's what it does. It takes the image. And instead of telling the system that there's people and there's trees in this image, it doesn't say anything. Here's an image, and the system hides a piece of the image and now needs to learn to predict what was the missing patch of the image. Of course, you know, when you feed the image in the system, you know what is there. So you hide it from the system. It predicts what it is. If it gets it right, great. We don't change the weights of the neural network. If it gets it wrong, we reveal what information was wrong and we tweak the weights in order to give it a better chance next time to predict the right information in that. So it doesn't need any human concept. It still needs a lot of data, but the data doesn't need to be annotated. So it's not supervised, it's self-supervised. And it's remarkable how well it's able to reconstruct some of these images. And so what I'm showing at the beginning of this is really a gray patch that's been applied. It's a large, it should start up again. It's a large amount of the image that's initially covered, and it learns after a lot of training to essentially reconstruct these images with a large degree of fidelity. This kind of system hasn't been used just for general images. This is actually a technique that we used in 2020. Um, as with everyone else, you know, when the pandemic hit, we tried to figure out how could we be useful within the set of skills that we had. We partnered with doctors here at the SHIM, as well as some hospitals in New York, to develop a system to predict the um, clinical trajectory of patients with COVID. At the time, we had very little data from COVID patients. It was very difficult. We didn't have annotation. In this case, we were looking at x-ray scans from chest x-rays. We didn't have annotated data, and so we used self-supervised learning, meaning we used data from other x-rays of patients with respiratory diseases, not COVID, that were obtained. And we trained it with self-supervised learning to reconstruct the images of these respiratory conditions in patients. And after that, with a little amount of data, we fine-tuned the model to predict the trajectory of these COVID patients. 
And what was fascinating is, in a way, this way that the machines were learning mimicked the way that the doctors were learning at the same time. Many of them didn't know what were the clinical manifestation of COVID in an x-ray. They were trained with other respiratory diseases to look for certain signs of inflammation, for example, and so on. And they transferred those skills over to the COVID patient population. And we were able to do that similarly with some of these uh, data sets with our systems. And so where we are today with a self-supervised technique, the advantage of self-supervised learning is you can also use it across different modalities, whether you're feeding in images, speech, language, other types of data. The system learns by itself. So you can feed it, for example, a movie. You give it the flowing image, and you ask it to reconstruct the sound. Or you give it the sound, you ask it to reconstruct the image. It's able to band across these modalities in a much better way. It gives us the promise, we're not quite there today, but really what we're working on is the promise of this unified model. Instead of having a different model for each modality, you can feed in large amounts of data of different types, and it, through self-supervised learning, it learns to reconstruct the data. And then with just a little bit of annotated data, you can get it to also predict some very specific concepts. And so this is really the frontier where, where a lot of the research community is operating right now. I'll give you a few examples of systems that we've built in the last year or so that leverage this technology. The first one you may have heard about that is really the advent of language models. So the ability to automatically understand spoken language, written language for the most part. The first example I'll show you, we can talk a little bit about spoken language after, but written language, because we have very, very large corpuses, you're essentially learning a representation of words of sentences, of paragraphs, and of whole documents. And so, you know, I explained how these concepts are represented by a list of numbers or a matrix. And so any resolution of concept can be represented by a matrix. When it's a very complicated concept, you need a very large matrix. When it's a pretty simple concept, you can get away with a small matrix. We do this for words, we do this for sentences, paragraphs, and so on. These models are trained with large amounts of data and when I say large amounts of data, you know, we're talking the model sizes on the y-axis here. And so this is the size of that matrix that is storing the set of concept for language. We're in the, you know, hundreds of billions of parameters at this time. And you're seeing the progression, <laughs> the direction of where it's going. We're sort of waiting to see. It's a little bit of a, um, a race towards the larger language. As we grow these language, we keep on seeing an improvement. You may have heard about the GPT-3 model that was released last year. It's a model specifically of this flavor. It's shown over here. GPT-3 had 175 billion parameters, was able to complete sentences in a way that's really quite credible. Some people are seeing into this evidence of logical reasoning. I would be a little bit more conservative on that topic. Some people have claimed that these model are emergent notions of sentience. I would be even more skeptical of those claims. But nonetheless, their ability to complete sentences, paragraphs, is, is actually uncanny in some cases. Um, in the work that we do, I think it was mentioned in the intro, I, I do work for Meta, previously Facebook. Um, we are a lab that actually is really fully dedicated to open science. So all the research that we do is shared in papers and, and code is available. So we've released earlier this year a version of the model called OPT-175B that's available for research purposes. So you can go in and request access to the model if it's useful in the context of your, of your work. And we've shared it already with hundreds of researchers around the world. For research purposes at this time, rather than for product use cases, really the, the, the stage at which we are requires further analysis before we really know where to deploy these models sort of in the wild. And so we've limited it to research release, but we are open to, to doing that across communities. These systems are also being used to build machine translation systems. So a system that can translate from one language to the other, either written language or spoken language. And if you look at how we do the translation in this case, we again have this representation. We're trying to go from one language to another language. For many years, we had to go from one language to English and from English to this other language. Let's say you want to go from French to Finnish. You have to go French to English, English to Finnish. Because we had so much data in English, that was essentially grounding all of the translation for the automated machine translation system. 
for the last two years or so, we've had a system that does multilingual translation directly from one language to another, in particular certain families of language, so between French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, all of which has some commonalities, really there's no need to go through English to get a good translation, so it's leveraging these language families to build strong multilingual representation. And it's been fascinating to see the progress in terms of the quality of these models. I'll show you really briefly a little bit of a, a little bit of a curve. What you're seeing here in the black line is these bilingual systems that always translate pairwise languages. They have several pairs, but all the systems are built for pairs of language. In contrast, in blue, you have the lines of systems that are doing multilingual translation. So in one system, you're essentially encoding the ability to translate between several different languages. M to M100 allows you to translate between 100 languages. MBART was between 50 languages. What you see around beginning of 2021 is that the multilingual models are actually starting to achieve better performance than all the pairwise models, which is very interesting for many reasons. First of all, it means that we are getting much better translation for languages for which we have small amounts of data, sometimes called low resource languages. It actually improves the quality of translation for those languages more than for the majority language. Secondly, machine learning algorithms have a tendency to really normalize information. They seek the ability to predict, and so that means that they sort of push all of your data towards the norm. When we have these bilingual systems always going through English, there's a normalization of all forms of human expression towards the English language, towards the English culture. And when you build a multilingual system, you allow it to capture much richer representation and let those live inside the parameters of our models. And so with this type of technology earlier this year, we built a system that is able to do translation between 200 different languages. The accuracy is not the same for all the languages. The amount of data we have varies tremendously between some of these languages, but nonetheless, the first time we had a release of a system that could reasonably translate between 200 languages, written form, not oral form, but we're now working towards spoken language translation. As we get to some of these languages with less data, um, we also start seeing all the languages that don't have any written script or any written form that are only living through um, oral tradition and trying to build tools uh, to, to facilitate the translation of those languages, the access of people from those community towards other cultures. And so this also is, is, is available. There's a paper that describes the work. There's, there's code that's available uh, for people who may be interested in this. It's, again, really a research project and prototype at this stage. Some of the earlier projects that I've, that I've listed sort of on the early slides have made it all the way to product, not this particular 200 languages one, but they are powering some of the translation technology that's running on the Facebook platform, Instagram, and others. Beyond language models, translation system, one of the main area of work with self-supervised learning is actually the development of conversational agents, so chatbots. In this case, the goal is to develop a system that's able to engage in conversation with a human. And so in some ways, it's been sort of the long dream of AI, going back to Turing, 1950s, sort of establishing this notion of a Turing test, the ability for an AI system to carry out a conversation with a human for a certain period of time without the human knowing whether they were conversing with a machine or with another human. And so it's been this long stream of work on this technique. For many years, some of the best chatbot agents were scripted. They were sort of the, the classic AI variety. And, and they were scripted in a way to really constrain the conversation and keep the conversation on topics that the chatbot was really um, informed about and you know had been programmed inside of the inside of the instructions of the system. Um, over the last few years, we've really leveraged all the work on self-supervised learning to build richer chatbots that can actually serve in an open domain setting, meaning you know they can take on almost any conversation topic. Um, they can leverage data directly from the web to inform the conversation. They have a they have a memory that they've built and they're able to sustain conversation over several turns and maintain continuity in terms of the topic over those several turns. They're not perfect. It's very well known that they will hallucinate information. They will complete things with other pieces of information that they're just kind of plugging in. Remember how the self-supervised learning works, right? You hide a piece of the image and it reconstructs it. 
It does the same for the dialogue. And so it tries to reconstruct what would be the next piece of conversation, sometimes completely imagining information, and you can sort of prompt it to do that. But nonetheless, there's been quite a lot of progress, some of it powered by these large language models that I've described a little bit earlier. Um, we did a open, in this case, we released a demo of a chatbot, so um, you can access that, that at the Blenderbot uh, just by looking for the Blenderbot. It's unfortunately only available in the U.S. right now. Um, and so for those of you who are in the U.S. or have a VPN access into the U.S., you can go and have a chat with a bot and, and play with it. Um, and it's quite, it's quite interesting to see the, the types of conversations that you can have in terms of really, really opening it up compared to previous bots that were much more, much more constrained. Um, again, just to give you a little bit of a taste of what goes on under the hood of these kinds of systems, these are complex systems. They leverage a lot of data. There's sort of an access to the internet to pull data in real time. There's a memory store that gets built in there. When you're having the conversation, there may be a sense that you have no idea how the bot is coming with these answers. But again, the point I want to drive is that we do have a pretty good understanding, characterization, ability to audit the systems that are coming up with these kinds of uh, information. And we can kind of trace it in a very precise way um, compared to what people may be thinking. Um, I don't, of course, expect to go through all the details of this particular module today. Those who are interested, the paper's available. And the other thing I want to highlight is um, we've done a lot of work to build in safety models for these uh, systems. And so I've been really pushing um, that when we build these systems, we take a responsible approach towards that, meaning that there's a notion of state of the art from a technology point of view, you know, having the best performance in terms of the quality of the conversation, but there's also a notion of state of the art in terms of responsibility. So having the best possible tools incorporated in the systems in terms of, in this case, safety means preventing the bot from going into conversation topics that may be inappropriate, that may be harmful, that may promote hateful messages and so on. And so we've built up several characteristics inside of the system, made them public, released them and so on, so that they become the norm in these systems. There's no zero risk with these systems. You know, there's really a sense that you could still push it and egg it onto some uh, topics. Um, but we really need to sort of develop the safety modules at the same speed that we develop the quality of the conversation module. That's the approach that we're really pursuing and, and that is getting a lot of traction across the community. And so with this particular release, we were able to, um, in just two months or so, gather data from 300 different, 300,000 different conversations um, with uh, people who were interested in, in just getting into conversation with a bot. 27% of participants, actually, we gave a very easy option to flag content uh, or give feedback on content. It was very much a research release, not a product release, so we engage with the public to provide some feedback uh, generously. Um, and so 27% of participants gave feedback on 2.5 million messages from the bot. We have about a 1% of content that's been flagged as nonsensical, so it's good to know when we know which content it is and we know where to push in terms of developing the quality of the model. Uh, almost a percent flagged as off topic and 0.1% uh, flagged as inappropriate. So again, you know, we can use some of that to keep on developing the safety modules as well as the, the prediction module of the bot. And so more and more, I think, you know, we need to get comfortable with doing releases of some of these models within controlled circumstances, because this is a bot that had been in development for several years in one of the best AI research labs in the world, and still there's a gap in performance between where it is and where we need to be. And really the best way to improve that is by sharing that research outside of the lab and being able to gather data from a what much wider set of individuals. It includes some amount of risk, um, but, it, but it also includes incredibly rich information to have that sort of participatory approach to development of AI. In this case, we released not just the demo, uh, it was only one piece of it. We released a paper, we released the actual model, so all these you know, matrices, 175 billion, you can load them up if you have the compute to do that. 
Um, we have a model card that describes in detail the characteristics of the model, a data card that gives a full account of the data sets that were used to train the model, which is something that unfortunately isn't always released. And we have all the logbooks, literally like the notes of our engineers who trained the system of what they needed to do to get that system trained up. Um, so we're really pushing that approach towards participatory science, um, open science also to give a sense of how to use these systems. If you have an opportunity, maybe this one, maybe something else, really, you know, working with the AI systems as a, a, as a participant uh, gives you another view onto what they can or can't do and gives you a better understanding of the limitations. Um, I, I, as, I, as I share all this with you, I would say I, I do encourage you to be really thoughtful about reading the fine print on a lot of the results. It, there's, a, there's a tendency to really um, turn many of the AI research results into sort of sensational headlines these days. It's, it's a little bit surprising how much you just, you know, we, we use archive a lot as our place for sharing papers. You like drop a paper on archive and all of a sudden there's like media headlines of, of the work uh, within the day that are picking out one or two pieces that are not representative of what's really into the paper. We've gone so far as having headlines that say that you know, AI systems can like pass the bar exam um, and so on. And actually, you know, if you dig into that specific result with you know, real research integrity, the, 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 as far as we know, the result doesn't hold. And, and secondly, no, no actual um, system has been released in an open science way that we can even validate whether that's true or not. So really, you know, as you hear of those results, look for the results that have been open source, that have been reproduced, and read the fine print would be my advice, or <laughs> consult with your favorite AI researcher to know that. Because right now it's a little bit hard to distinguish the fact from the fiction without going deep into these results, and doing that doesn't help anyone in any way. So just a, just a few more thoughts. Um, on the one hand, you know, we are seeing this surge of intelligence system going everywhere. Um, and, and it may be seeming like this is uh, going quite fast. It is going fast, quite honestly. Um, we have to have a deep conversation together across disciplines of how to make sure that the innovation on the technical side and on the social side is sort of matched in terms of pace. Let me give you a quick taste of where we're going on, more looking towards the future. Um, I've, I've talked about supervised learning. I talked about self-supervised learning. What we really are aiming at is building what I'm going to call world models. And so not only are they able to distill all sorts of information and make predictions, but they can actually predict the, enough of the future that you can use them for planning, for decision making, to understand causal effects of interventions. This is something that our models don't really have right now. But once you have that level of modeling, you essentially can create very, very rich simulation. Um, so that's sort of the next frontier for us at the technical point of view. We're not there yet. We have some of the elements, but we're not really there yet. The other piece I want to share is about data generation. Um, we've started to see some results of systems that you actually give them essentially just a small prompt and it generates a whole new example. And so, you know, in this case on the left, we have examples of images that were fed into the system. And on the right, all of these are images that are completely synthetically created by our system. They're sample from our generative image model. And the quality of this image has been increasing drastically. Similar trajectory as I showed you for annotation of concept. On the left, we have a system from 2015. In this case, you see, you know, it's very low resolution. You can't really tell it. You know, we give it as a prompt. The phrase, a bowl of bananas, is on the table. It's a simple prompt. It's the kind of thing that, you know, probably like a seven or eight-year-old can draw reasonably well. Our machines are really low resolution. 2020, we have a system that actually can handle much more complicated concept. Like we have a family, they're standing, they're wearing skis, holding some ski poles. This is 2020, but the, there's some artifacts, like the faces look totally wrong on these people if you look close enough. 2022, again, span of seven years. 2022, we have the DALI system released earlier this week, year, the quality of the images and the complexity of the sentence. You know, you go from a bowl of banana, then you go to teddy bears mixing sparkling chemicals as mad scientists in a steampunk style. Like just the richness of the concept that that appeals to and the image that matches it is quite remarkable. Um, in this type of technology, you know, there's all sorts of use cases for it. 
On the one hand, you can use this to really allow anyone to be very, very creative, and we've used it to sort of see reinterpretation of the great masters. You can use it for very utilitarian um, things. We've used it for reconstructing MRI images so that you can do MRI acquisition much faster than before. Instead of being an hour in the MRI machine, after 15 minutes, we can get a high quality resolution image. You can use it also to create misinformation and deep fakes. Same technology on all of these fronts. And so we have to be really thoughtful about how we build this technology, how we deploy it, how we govern that. Most recent uh, result just from last week, fresh off the press, we have these cute little videos. In this case, the prompt is a sentence, and not only do we generate an image, we actually generate a short five-second video. I think the fluffy baby sloth is the cutest one of them all, and you can get like fluffy baby sloths of like hundreds of different variations. The system called Make a Video that was just coming out, and so you know, really. The image state-of-the-art results came out in the spring, and it was a little bit of a, a waiting game to see, you know, what would be, how would it look with video, and already we have some video results coming out. Three different systems coming out last week across, uh, the, across the community. This is, uh, this is one of them where I've been more closely involved, but it's been phenomenal to see the, the progress, just looking at it from a technology standpoint of this. This is short videos. We don't yet have long-ranging videos. In particular, temporal coherence is very difficult. So this is something that we're working on. We'll see how it goes. Um, I, I'll talk just really briefly of the really, really long term. You know, I, I do work for a company that renamed itself from Facebook to Meta and, and with an ambition to, to build up the metaverse. I won't talk about it at length today. But, but I do think, in a sense, you know, a lot of the technology that is being built is eventually going to move into this space of these multiple universe. Um, and and the, the particular, the content creation part, I showed you images and videos, but we can do the same with speech and with sound, eventually with touch and with smells. And when that technology improves, it gives us the ability to build these very immersive environments on which we'll be able to generate completely new synthetic experience that really changes our notion of changes our notion of space, and changes our notion of um, interaction between people. It changes eventually our notion of society. Poses some profound questions around all of this. Um, it's a bit of a whirlwind tour. I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. So I'll I'll close in just a few minutes. One of the things I want to mention, and I, this has been a bit of a repeating thing in, the, in, in this talk, right? I, I, I bring up what is, what is possible from a technical point of view, and then I think it's important for us to look at what's the potential in terms of improving people's lives. In this case, the metaverse may seem very foreign, and it may have you know, a bit of this impression to you of like, what am I going to do in there? Um, I, I do think there is a generational thing. Um, you know, in a sense, the metaverse may not be for, for some of us, but you know, I have 13-year-olds at home, and you know, the, the, v, the VR experience to them is absolutely fabulous. And so they will be creating it and leaving it much more than us. But we do have to prepare the grounds such that it's done in a way that is positive and responsible. And if I look at just one specific domain where I do a little bit of more work, which is medicine as an example, you know, we are just coming out of two and a half years of, of pandemic where we have to shift everything that we do online. And if we look just at the delivery of high quality medicine across our community, the potential of this technology is huge. We can enable much richer patient consultation and treatment. We can enable pain management. We can actually have virtual reality training for our physicians. That means that they have much richer experience. And so the potential is, is, is immense. Just looking at this very narrow sphere, um, it, it extends in similar, in similar ways elsewhere. Um, but, but, you know, we have to prepare for this notion of, of deploying these agents across several spheres. So let me just jump to, I'll skip a few things um, and emphasize two points. One of them is, you know, we, we do have to be very conscious that when we deploy these technologies, they're trained on data. And they do have very much 
this this attraction towards normalization, towards the majority of the data, towards reproducing some of the patterns of inequities that we see in our society. We've seen some results in terms of, you know, the, the way that the results are reported in terms of the accuracy of these systems isn't fully characterized according to different populations in a way that may marginalize some populations. And so it's important to be very aware of what some of these risks are. There's a sense that the Data itself is responsible for this. It's not just the data, I assure you. There's many aspects of the development of the technology where that can actually influence what the decisions will be. Um, the data quantity is definitely an issue. You know, whenever we have less data, the performance of the model is less good. The data quality is also an issue. You know, I talked about training large language model. Whether we train them on a data set called common crawl, which is essentially a big dump of every data you can imagine on the internet, versus you train them on a corpus built from archive, which consists only of research papers, the quality of the model, the type of discourse that you get is completely different. The amount of hateful speech you get is completely different. The amount of misinformation you get is completely different. So both the data quantity and quality are major factors in this, and we have to be very careful of looking at what's the data that we put into their system. Um, beyond the creation of all of this, we are creating essentially new, new worlds, new norms, for our society. I don't think we can avoid thinking about this. It's very hard to know how to take on these questions, especially when you come from a very narrow discipline, but in many ways that's the reason I'm here today, that's the reason I ex accepted this invitation, so that we can have this conversation across the boundaries of our discipline. I'm keenly aware that if you just take a group of computer scientists and ask them to just create the technology, you will not get a full um, full set of perspectives on how we should be building not just new identities, new experiences, but new norms for our societies. And so some of the themes that are coming up in the discussion, and I'm not alone, there's several other researchers in the AI community who are keenly aware of the importance of having these cross-disciplinary discussions and to tackle questions of how will we set up models for governance, for community standards, justice, wellness, accessibility, and safety are just a few of the themes that are commonly coming across. But I think I want to share with you just the opportunity that there is to come into this conversation and, and really help us shape the, the place and the role that this technology will be taking in our society. Um, as we have these conversations, I think it's important to really always keep in mind the fact that we need to be mindful of the levels of autonomy. There's sometimes a sense of like, you know, AI system are all the same. Um, to be put in the same bucket together, to be regulated in the same way, to be adopted or rejected in the same way. And, and I do think it's important to be thoughtful about the level of autonomy that's in the system. In many ways, you know, the way forward is going to be in collaborative human and machine systems. I've heard the term assistant, inte assistant intelligence, which I think is very apropos. And so we have to think of how we're we going to match the level of responsibility to the level of autonomy of our systems and build that accountability with that in mind. And I do think having a really tight cycle between research and practice is essential. Doing research launches that we can sort of release in controlled conditions from these AI agents in the wild, as I sometimes call it, observe what we can, get the data, bring that back into our research and have that cycle. Be very thoughtful of how we set up that cycle is absolutely essential to be making progress in a positive direction. Um, I personally have been a huge advocate of open science. Um, it, may, it may seem a little bit different than how some other communities are going. I would say that the AI community, the research community, has been uh, very uh, receptive to this idea. The notion of publishing in open science uh, conferences and journals is the norm, absolutely, in our community. The open sourcing of code is a little bit more work in progress, I would say, because in particular, a lot of the work that is done on these very, very large models is done in industry. And across industry, you do see a varying set of approaches to open science. 
Um, I'll be honest with you, the reason that I, I am working at Meta, and we can have a longer discussion about uh, the pros and cons of that decision, but, but honestly, the commitment to open science that I have seen coming from that company for research in AI is, uh, is unseen anywhere else. And over five years, all the work that we have done in Montreal and across all of our labs in the world has been open source and shared publicly which is, I think, a huge benefit to the advancement of the conversation on the themes I've brought up today. Um, and there's a lot of codes, not you know, just from us, of course, startups and universities everywhere are building code that makes it easier to reproduce the results of the work. And there too, I think this notion of linking open science with reproducibility that gives us the accountability and the understanding, the interpretability of our systems is absolutely essential. So I'll be continuing to work in that direction. With that, thank you so much.